kill Ashley. I really didn't. You really think I did? I didn't mean to hurt him. I agree with the family. I hope you die in prison as well. You know, if this was a death penalty state, you'd be getting the chair. In the blink of an eye, futures are shattered and lives are forever changed. This is not just a moment. It's the turning point where youth collides with the unforgiving reality of the law. They were once just teenagers, navigating the complexities of adolescence. But a single decision catapulted them into the harsh glare of the courtroom, facing the gravest of consequences. Dangerous teens. Reacting to life sentences takes you inside the pivotal moments when reality hits like a thunderbolt. Witness the raw, unfiltered reactions of those who, in the throes of youth, find themselves staring down the abyss of a life sentence. Prepare yourself for a journey into the heart of the justice system, where the line between right and wrong blurs, and the consequences of actions are irrevocable. Join us as we delve deep into the stories of lives paused at the crossroads of destiny. This is Nicholas Lindsay, Killer Murders Police Officer. Nicholas Lindsay's story unfolds in the shadowed streets of St. Petersburg, Florida, a tale steeped in the stark realities of crime and its ripple effects across lives and communities. On a chilling night in February 2011, the city's underbelly whispered of a looming tragedy that would soon grip the hearts of its residents. Officer David Crawford, a stalwart of justice with 25 years of service under his belt, was in pursuit of normalcy amidst the city's nocturnal unrest. His mission was to investigate a seemingly mundane report of a suspicious person or vehicle, a routine check in the life of a seasoned police officer. Little did he know, this encounter would mark his last. Nicholas Lindsay, a teenager embroiled in the tempestuous throes of youth and misguided decisions, was that suspicious person. At just 16, his life was a tapestry of complex circumstances, now on the verge of a tragic turn. Attempting to break into vehicles, Lindsay was confronted by Officer Crawford. The confrontation escalated quickly, and in a series of moments laden with tension and fear, Lindsay fired several shots, sealing both his fate and Crawford's. The dawn brought the weight of reality crashing down on Lindsay as he was arrested. The interrogation room became a crucible of emotion, yielding a confession that would echo through the corridors of the court. Lindsay's age, a tender 16, stood at the forefront of his trial, casting a long shadow over the proceedings. Here was a boy, caught in the unforgiving gears of the justice system, facing a crime that bore the gravest of consequences. Convicted of first-degree murder in 2012, Lindsay's sentence was a life without parole, a stark end to a path marred by a fateful decision. Yet, the narrative took a turn with the Supreme Court's stance against mandatory life sentences for juveniles. Lindsay's sentence was revisited, offering a glimmer of hope in the form of a possible review after 25 years. This story, set against the backdrop of youthful indiscretion and irrevocable choices, weaves a complex narrative of justice, redemption, and the harsh lessons of accountability. It delves deep into the heart of societal challenges, prompting reflection on the delicate balance between punishment and the potential for change. Nicholas Lindsay's case, a somber chapter in the annals of youth crime in America, serves as a poignant reminder of the lasting impact of our actions and the enduring quest for justice in the face of tragedy. In the chilling culmination of a trial that spanned an entire week in March 2012, Nicholas Lindsay, at the tender age of 17, was found guilty of taking Officer David Crawford's life, receiving a life sentence without the prospect of parole. Despite being prosecuted as an adult, Lindsay's youth played a crucial role in sparing him from the death penalty. The saga took a further dark twist two years later when, during an appeal, Lindsay's life sentence was affirmed. The courtroom was left in silent disbelief as Lindsay responded to the judge's decree with a grin, a reaction that sent ripples of shock and dismay through those present. This display of apparent insensitivity particularly haunted David Crawford's daughter, Amanda. Confronted by a sea of reporters and the weight of her loss, Amanda publicly addressed Lindsay's unsettling demeanor in the courtroom. Her words highlighted not just her own anguish, but also the broader community's horror at the lack of remorse exhibited by Lindsay. 
a teenager whose life had taken such a tragically wayward path. Glad it's over. It just kind of proves to me that he's an animal as he sat there smiling. This is Danta Wright Murderer of Michigan Teen. In the shadowed corners of Ann Arbor, a story unfolded that would etch itself into the fabric of the community, a stark reminder of the fragility of trust and the devastating consequences of betrayal. This is the harrowing tale of Danta Wright and the murder of Jordan Klee, a narrative that weaves through the darkest corridors of youth and desperation. In the haunting annals of teenage crime, the unsettling composure of 18-year-old Danta Wright stands out starkly. During his appearance in the Washtenaw County Trial Court in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Wright's reactions to being sentenced for the brutal murder of fellow 18-year-old and high school senior Jordan Klee were disturbingly calm and disconcerting. Klee, a standout football player at Pioneer High School, harbored ambitions of playing for Michigan University, a dream brutally cut short before he could even celebrate his high school graduation. The tragic end to Klee's aspirations unfolded on October 4, 2016. His lifeless body was discovered by a maintenance worker at Pine Lake Village Apartment Complex in Ann Arbor, marked by a solitary gunshot wound to the head, a silent testament to the violence he suffered. As the news of the tragedy spread like wildfire, the community was engulfed in shock and mourning. How could a life so full of potential be snuffed out so senselessly? And how could a young soul be driven to commit such an irreversible act? These questions haunted the nights and clouded the days in Ann Arbor. In the shadowed aftermath of Jordan Klee's tragic demise, a sinister revelation emerged that would cast a long, dark shadow over the town of Ann Arbor. Three teenagers, Danta Wright, Delrano Gracie, and Jermarius Ellison, found themselves ensnared by the law, their ties to a nefarious street gang unveiled in the wake of a meticulously orchestrated investigation sparked by crucial tips. The specter of their crime loomed large, a haunting reminder of a young life brutally cut short. Months drifted by, bearing the weight of sorrow and unanswered questions until a stunning confession during a June 2017 hearing shattered the veneer of normalcy. Danta Wright, with a chilling nonchalance that belied the gravity of his actions, admitted to orchestrating the fatal encounter that claimed Jordan Klee's life, a robbery gone awry that culminated in a bullet to the back of Klee's head, a merciless execution. The courthouse, a silent witness to countless tales of justice Stay and retribution, became the stage for a confrontation steeped in raw emotion and unresolved grief as we learned the large. Heads. A reflection then, of the court's struggle to maintain its sanctity against the backdrop of Wright's blatant disrespect. In a dramatic off. turn Stay of safe, events, everyone. the court recessed, a brief interlude of deliberation that weighed heavily on the hearts of all present. The decision not to pursue a trial made by Klee's family in a bid to spare themselves as further anguish, marked a poignant chapter in their journey toward closure. Upon resumption, Wright's counsel offered a meager apology, attributing his client's appalling conduct to deep-seated emotional turmoil. Judge Swartz, his resolve unshaken, imposed a sentence that echoed the severity of Wright's crime, a somber testament to the irreparable loss suffered by Jordan Klee's loved ones. As Wright was led away, the echoes of his laughter lingered, a haunting refrain that begged the question, would the harsh reality of his imprisonment wipe the smile from his face? Or would it serve as a grim reminder of the indelible scars left on the community by his actions? Wright faced Klee's bereaved family. Anticipation of a solemn and respectful proceeding quickly dissolved into chaos, the air thick with tension and disbelief. Wright's demeanor, a grotesque display of insensitivity mocked the solemnity of the court as he smiled and chuckled through the victim's family's heart-wrenching testimony, a provocation that stirred the somber audience to tears and indignation. Judge David Swartz, presiding over this theater of justice, found his patience tested as Wright's audacious behavior threatened to derail the sentencing. The prospect of rejecting the plea bargain loomed large, a reflection of the court's struggle to maintain its sanctity against the backdrop of Wright's blatant disrespect. In a dramatic turn of events, the court recessed, a brief interlude of deliberation that weighed heavily on the hearts of all present. 
the decision not to pursue a trial made by Klee's family in a bid to spare themselves further anguish mark it a point and chapter in their journey toward closure. But watching you sit there, smile, laugh, and shake your head like this was no big deal, I'm very tempted to just say, I'm not going to accept this sentence agreement. We'll go to trial, and if you're convicted of felony murder, you'll go to prison for the rest of your life. That means you'll die there. Judge Swartz, his resolve unshaken, imposed a sentence that echoed the severity of Wright's crime, a somber testament to the irreparable loss suffered by Jordan Clee's loved ones. Or would it serve as a grim reminder of the indelible scars left on the community by his actions? I've lost laughter and love. I no longer have the hope of having grandchildren. I've lost the enjoyment of holidays and birthdays and of everyday life. This is Mackenzie Shirilla who killed boyfriend in 160 kilometer to H crash. We're learning more about the two young men killed in a horrific crash yesterday morning. In the quiet suburbs where tranquility reigns and darkness hides secrets, the story of Mackenzie Shirilla unfolds, a narrative that blurs the lines between love, obsession, and the unthinkable. This tale, steeped in horror and suspense, journeys into the heart of a darkness so profound it chills the soul. At the tender age of 19, she faced the somber judgment of the law convicted and sentenced for steering her destiny and that of others toward irrevocable darkness. This was not reckless driving. This was murder. With deliberate intent, she propelled her car into a brick wall at a harrowing speed of 160 kilometers, a decision that extinguished the lives of her boyfriend and a friend in an instant. In an extraordinary twist of fate that defies belief, a teenage girl becomes embroiled in a harrowing murder case, catapulting her car at a death-defying speed of 100 miles per hour directly into a solid brick barrier. The devastating impact claims the lives of her 20-year-old boyfriend Dominic Russo and their 19-year-old friend Davian Flanagan, who was tragically seated in the rear of the vehicle. Captured on surveillance footage, the chilling sound of Mackenzie's car tears through the air like a missile before meeting its explosive end against the brick wall. The courtroom heard peculiar details, including Mackenzie's choice of footwear, fuzzy Prada slippers, while the accelerator was floored to its maximum, hinting at the sheer force behind the vehicle's fatal acceleration. Miraculously, Mackenzie emerged from the wreckage alive. The prosecution painted a grim picture, suggesting Mackenzie was not merely involved in an accident, but was executing a meticulously planned act of murder-suicide. They revealed she had even undertaken a rehearsal of this deadly drive days before the tragic event, signaling a premeditated path to destruction. The prosecution delved into the turbulent dynamics of Sharila's relationship with Russo, shedding light on the threatening behavior she exhibited towards him in the weeks preceding the tragic incident. Witnesses testified that Sharila had ominously warned of crashing her car during a heated argument with Russo a chilling prophecy that materialized just two weeks later. This testimony, coupled with compelling video evidence, played a crucial role in the deliberations of Cuyahoga County Common Pleas. Judge Nancy Margaret Russo during the sentencing on August 14, 2023. As you review that exhibit, you know that you are watching oncoming deaths of two people, and there is nothing that will stop it. As Judge Russo articulated her pre-sentencing remarks, Mackenzie Shirilla was overwhelmed by emotion, her tears flowing freely as the gravity of her situation became painfully clear. Highlighting the calculated nature of Shirilla's actions, the judge noted her deliberate reconnaissance of the crash site, an unusual and seldom traveled route, days before the calamity. This pointed to a sinister level of premeditation, underscoring her awareness of the potential harm her actions could inflict not just on the vehicle's occupants, but also on innocent bystanders. In a poignant conclusion, Judge Russo, bearing no familial connection to Dominic Russo, unequivocally declared Sharila's intent to murder her boyfriend, condemning her actions in no uncertain terms. Mackenzie Sharila was found guilty of the murders of Dominic Russo and Davian Flanagan, receiving two concurrent sentences of 15 years to life. The moment the verdict was announced, Shirila's distress erupted into uncontrollable weeping. Handcuffed and escorted from the courtroom, her journey from a defendant's seat to a state correctional facility marked the grim end of a saga that left indelible scars on all involved.